Hi everyone, today I want to talk to you about some options you have for uh, your Module 3 journal. Um, the first one is a photo by Tuco Vieira, um, taken in 2004, and the second one is a poem by Rudyard Kipling, um, famous for writing The Jungle Book, uh, and the poem is entitled The White Man's Burden. Uh, so before I begin, I just want to make sure that you had a chance to watch the Malvina Hoffman videos that I posted last week. Um, there is an exhibit at the Field Museum going over Hoffman's um, bronzes, uh, and these were done of the races of the world. Um, originally, that exhibit lasted from the 30s to the 60s. Um, it was taken down uh, because it was deemed racist, um, and intentionally so. Um, and then it was later brought back um, just a couple years ago as a commentary on the original exhibit, and you can still see that commentary exhibit today. And I also posted a video um, reflecting on um, that uh, that's actually shown in that exhibit as well. So if you haven't had a chance to look at that video, it's a fantastic video. It's a great way to frame our conversation. Um, today we're going to continue that conversation on the interactions between Western civilizations uh, and the indigenous peoples of the world. And specifically we'll be focusing on the ideas of race and empire. Um, and these link directly back to our module theme of power and people. All right. So the first of these artifacts um, comes um, from Tuco Vieira. Um, he took this photo of Sao Paulo um, during the uh, uh, um, Brazil Olympics. Um, so if you remember, um, in 2016 and 2014, Brazil um, hosted two mega sporting events. The first one was um, the World Cup, and the second one was the Summer Olympics. Um, and during that time period, uh, Brazil came under fire, um, specifically, specifically for its economic and its social class issues. Um, and so this image um, taken from above, from a helicopter, uh, shows the direct class divide between the poor in the favelas on the left and the wealthy um, in those uh, condominiums on the right. And that is permanent housing on the right. Um, so that um, shows the, the big gap um, in Brazil's economic structure. Um, this came under fire largely because Brazil is a is a um, massive economy in the world today, right? It's the ninth largest economy in the world today. Um, that number sometimes fluctuates. Some economists believe the number that the Brazil will actually continue to grow. Um, some are saying that they're going to stay a little bit more flat. Uh, but in any event, that growth has come at a price, and that price is a great economic divide between its poor and its wealthy. Um, and this image is a really great visual to show. Um, those issues that are happening in their country. So um, if you wanted to take a look um, at this image as an artifact for exploring our theme, this would be a great journal entry. Um, you could compare and contrast the poor to the wealthy. You can compare and contrast Brazil um, to the United States. You could compare and contrast um, the, the Portuguese um, and their influence in Brazil compared to the indigenous peoples that lived there, as well as the African slaves. Um, so one of the issues that Brazil is plagued with, even to this day, is great racial divide. And that stems back to its history, uh, where Brazil was um, one of the largest, if not the largest, uh, slave economies on the planet. Somewhere between uh, early 1500s all the way up to the 1860s, um, Brazil was a massive importer of slaves from Africa. Uh, so much so that over 2 million slaves were brought there, and at some point, uh, in its history, um, 70 to 80 percent of the population in Brazil were African slaves. This slave trade and, and this racial issue um, still has impact today. Uh, so there are still impacts left over from this massive um, ec economic structure that was built on slavery. Another exhibit at the Field Museum, um, another fantastic exhibit, showcases um, the slave trade in the Americas. Um, so you actually get to kind of walk through um, uh, kind of like an underground slave trade. Uh, it meant to kind of look like an old boat, and then at some point it goes into like an auction house. Um, and it describes the issues of American slaves um, in the United States, as well as slaves in Brazil. Um, so I highly recommend taking a look at that exhibit as well, virtually online. Uh, this issue of slavery um, continued throughout Brazil's history. Brazil ended up becoming the last country to abolish its slaves. Um, the last westernized country that's abolished its slaves. Uh, and because of that, um, there's a long legacy of economic equality linked to race. Um, to this day, Brazil still categorizes its people um, in very racial terms. Uh, so 
They have major kind of uh, classifications, usually based on color of skin, uh, but also based on hair texture um, and facial features. The major groups are um, Indian or the native peoples that lived in Brazil prior to Portuguese conquest. Um, the whites who uh, have European descent and a lot of it goes back to the Portuguese. Um, blacks are Africans who came from African slaves. Um, and then uh, Asians, Asian immigrants, which happened later in its history. Um, and then they actually qualify or cl uh, classify people based on the intermixing of racial ethnic groups, right? So for instance, black and white are categorized as mulatto. Some of these terms might be hard to swallow, especially because in the United States, we don't usually use these terms anymore. Um, but in Brazil's census today, um, they're still qualified people, um, very, very um, specific based on the heritage and background of the people. So just like in Brazil, in the US, we also had um, issues of slave trade and it, we had a, you know, we still are suffering some of the consequences of that slave trade. Uh, interestingly enough, um, slave trade also is linked to empire, right? And, and the ability to create empires is often on the backs of uh, the imprisoned and the oppressed. So, um, during the 1800s and early 1900s, America was going through kind of a question of its role in the world. It was not the, the world dominating force that it is today. It was still trying to find its place in the world. And really, uh, Great Britain and a lot of the European nations um, maintained their, their preeminency in, in world, the world affairs. During this time period, um, Rudyard Kipling, the author of the White Man's Burden poem, but also of more famous works such as like the Jungle Book, um, wrote allegorical uh, stories about the British Empire. Um, in fact, the Jungle Book is an allegory about the British Empire and its success. Um, and in fact, different animal groups represent different cultures of the world. Uh, Kipling was the son of, of British, um, uh, British soldiers and, and, and royals. Uh, but he was raised in India, so he had this um, unique insight of uh, the oppressed as well as um, the oppressor. Now, Kipling is an imperialist, right? So he's in favor of British, British dominate, dominance across the planet. Um, he believes that the, the Britain's um, dominance of the world was good for the world. It brought civilized culture to the world. Um, in fact, he's famously said um, that uh, the, the things that Britain brought to the world were Christianity, um, democracy and government, um, the, the King's English, right, um, and capitalism. And, and these things were um, the most important qualities that a country could have in order to become civilized. So in his poem, he says, take up the white man's burden. And as you can see in this cartoon that comes from around the same time period, uh, that burden is that the white man's culture is so superior um, that he has the burden of carrying all of the non-white cultures of the world on his back um, in order to civilize the planet. So in today's day and age, we normally wouldn't say these kinds of things, right? These are, these are pretty um, pejorative terms and this is pretty, pretty heinous and racist language. But in that time period, the thinking was that, uh, if you, you can see in this cartoon, that um, cultures from Asia and Africa were backwards and they needed white cultures to help them become civilized. This was the white man's burden and it was done so by force. So if a culture would not become civilized, they would become by, they would do so by force. Some, some theorists, a lot of historians argue that um, this was a convenient kind of way of explaining imperialism um, and that somehow kind of rose colors this idea that empires were really doing were um, stealing the resources of, of small impoverished nations in order to enrich themselves. Famously, the, the poem was actually written for America. So the idea was that um, if, if Britain had to carry Asia on its back, then America had to carry Africa and, and, and South America on its back. Um, and Kipling was calling for Americans to stop being isolationists and to become imperialists, just as Britain had done. It's a poem, so you know, one might argue, well, it's just a poem, so how does it have any real um, impact on the world? And I would argue it has some great impact on the world because if you listen to um, what Teddy Roosevelt says as a senator and then as a vice president and, and then becoming president, um, Roosevelt goes on to say about the poem, 
Uh, it's rather poor poetry, but good sense from the expansion point of view. In other words, um, he wasn't a fan necessarily of Kipling being a poet, but uh, when it came to the topic and the commentary, uh, Roosevelt said this, this should be policy. And as one of uh, expansionist presidents, right, um, it does become policy. So uh, a poem and an idea becomes part of American policy, which many argue is still part of our, our doctrines today. So um, just like the photograph by Tuco Rivera, which talked about um, the issues in Brazil, um, this Kipling poem talks about is historical issues of, uh, the, of Great Britain and America, uh, which are still relevant today as well. We can link all of this discussion to a, a book by William Easterly known as The White Man's Burden. Um, if you have a chance to take a look at this book, um, it's pretty dense, but it's a pretty, pretty amazing story. Um, what it does is it talks about the new white man's burden of today. And that new white man's burden is um, this idea that because we feel guilty in European descended cultures, right? So that would be um, Europe, the West, uh, and specifically America, because we feel guilty for the past practices. Um, we have done things like create foreign aid, um, create charities, do charitable works to try to help um, the impoverished countries of the world, right? So in other words, there are the first world countries and the third world countries, right? So we've got first world countries being these westernized countries like the US and Europe. And we've got third world countries like many of the cultures in um, South America, in Africa, and in parts of Asia. And the idea here is, is that the first world countries feel guilty for oppressing and exploiting third world countries. And so they do things like send aid to try to help these cultures. Now, Easterly is critical of this because he argues that um, the kind of aid that we give and the kind of ideas that we promote are guilty enough. Or in other words, we feel guilty, but we don't feel guilty enough to do real good. We just do enough good to kind of help some of these cultures stay afloat, but we have no intent of actually helping them um, in a real way or have retribution or um, uh, reparations uh, for past actions. And so the question I would pose to you that you might want to address in your journal is, um, is our foreign aid actually helpful? Are we actually helping other cultures? Are we actually helping them um, in ways that they need? Are we listening to those cultures? Um, a couple of examples I'll leave you with. Um, the first one was, uh, there was a report done, um, which I'll post in the links in this YouTube video, about Tom's Shoes. Now, Tom's Shoes is a phenomenal organization. Um, the idea behind the Tom's Shoes is that you buy a shoe, uh, buy a pair of shoes, and a, a second pair of shoes is sent off to um, an impoverished culture. Um, and, that, and, that, and that group would then have a pair of shoes for children who wouldn't have shoes normally. And the reason it was criticized is because it doesn't do enough right? So you give a pair of shoes to this poor child who doesn't have any, um, and, but you only do it once, and then that child doesn't have enough shoes for the rest of his life. And the reason there's criticism of this is that in some cultures, um, and in some places around the world where children don't wear shoes, um, they don't have shoes, and they end up building these calluses on the bottom of their feet, which protect their feet then um, from parasites and, and other kind of foreign bodies. Um, and so when they wear the pair of shoes at a young age, they don't develop these calluses. And then uh, when they outgrow the shoes, which I promise you children outgrow shoes very quickly, um, when they outgrow these shoes, they have very soft skin and parasites are easily able to crawl inside their feet. Um, so does this, this charitable work actually, is it good, right? Is it, is it a positive thing? Another, another cite, um, cited source of this was um, uh, uh, nearly a decade ago, some formula manufacturers um, had some formula that was close to expir expiration. And so what they did is they shipped it over to places in, um, it was either Uganda or Ghana, and um, they gave mothers formula. But the problem was um, the mothers gave their babies their formula and in the process, um, they were no longer able to nurse. And because we didn't continue to send over um, that formula, uh, many babies died from malnutrition because they didn't have the formula and they also didn't have nursing mothers. So th these are just some of the ideas um, that Easterly points to that um, we have to question, is our foreign aid and are our charitable ideas 
meant to try to repair our guilty feelings? And if so, do they come with any kind of success rates? Um, so I challenge you to look at yeah, either Tuco uh, Rivera's um, um, photograph of the uh, the favela in Sao Paulo as it butts up against the um, the, uh, the the wealthy condominium, or look at um, Roger Kipling's poem, The White Man's Burden, and its impact on U.S. foreign policy. And then you can certainly wrap all this up with this discussion of the white man's guilt um, or the new white man's burden proposed by Easterly. And in all of these cases, you're looking at um, issues between Western societies and indigenous peoples. You're looking at racial inequities that are created still to this day. Um, you might be discussing things like white privilege um, and, and the ideas of race and the definitions of race. Um, all hotbed discussions and hotbed topics um, and great fodder for a good journal. So um, good luck.